turn with me, please, to uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. The setting is the night our Lord was betrayed and arrested, led through the mockery of five illegal trials in the dead of night before the high priest, the former high priest, the king of Israel, and Roman officials, and so forth. And then the next day was crucified. He has gathered with his disciples for one final meal. It is the Passover, the time that Israel remembered their time of slavery in Egypt and how God freed them from slavery, led them back to their own land and established them as his nation and how the Pharaoh resisted that until God brought 10 plagues upon the land. Final plague being the firstborn of every household was stricken and died, except for all of the Israelites who obeyed God and sprinkled the blood of a lamb on the doorposts of their home. A picture, a type of Christ who saves us from our sin by the shedding of his blood on the cross. He's establishing the Lord's Supper with his disciples in this time. So they have the Passover meal and then he proceeds with the breaking of bread and the passing of the cup. So we're reading in Luke 22, beginning at verse 14, that when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you that I will not eat it again until it is, finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of, of God has come. He took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with me at the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. I will stop and ask the Lord's blessing on this portion of his word by giving us understanding and acceptance of it. As I mentioned to the adult class this morning, everything in the word of God is relevant to something important whether the statement or the event seems to have importance in its own right or not, it is relevant and it is uh, a reference to something of greater importance. And when something is lifted out of context, we run into problems with it not only the obvious problem of misunderstanding what is being taught, 
which is what has caused so many different interpretations of God's word and so many different denominations who base their their own particular belief system on someone's interpretation of of a certain passage of scripture or whatever that's not only a problem but when you do lift it out of context you lose the progression of what the Lord is teaching down through history a lot has been ignored or actually not even understood or learned that would flavor our real concept of what God is teaching us. For instance, I have heard many times over the years people who have a problem with the Old Testament and the God of the Old Testament. I hear God referred to sometimes that way. The God of the Old Testament, like he's different from the God of the New Testament. And the reason that they have a problem is because they look at some of the things that God taught and enforced in the Old Testament. And they think that it is too severe. All of the restrictions that are laid down under the letter of the law and how you could be stoned to death for certain offenses and the severity of punishment directed towards children who have no honor for their parents or who uh, continually are bringing uh, shame upon the uh, household and the parents. They look at this, and I've even heard one person say, God is illegal. God is unethical to kill people like this, to stone people like this. What they don't grasp is the concept of the dispensations that God has dealt with over the course of the history of mankind. We're looking at this in our Sunday morning study class now. Seven ways God has dealt with the world. Actually, six of them. We're in our sixth one. The seventh is when Christ comes back and rules for a thousand years. But I won't go into all those things, but they're, they range from innocence to uh, human government to the letter of the law, all pointing to one thing. There's only one way to salvation. Man cannot keep himself with God. Man cannot earn his way to heaven. Uh, innocence didn't work, and one man gov governing another man doesn't work. It is the heart turned to God. It is the work of Christ on the cross. Uh, they dis disregard that and they look at the God of the Old Testament as somebody that they don't want anything to do with. Likewise, you could take the Jewish practice of Passover. I just explained very briefly what that is all about. That is still practiced today and I am not faulting that at all, but I want us to understand that the Passover that Jesus participated in the night before he went to the cross, the Passover that he used to establish the Lord's Supper is the last divinely sanctioned Passover ever observed. The only Passover, the final Passover, that God accepted in its original intent. The reason for that is when Jesus died on the cross, the full meaning of Passover was fulfilled. As the angel of death passed over the house of every 
Israeli who had painted the blood of a lamb over the posts, that's what God has done with you and me as far as salvation. The blood of Christ has spared us hell, has paid for our sins, and we are experiencing the greatest Passover that ever was observed. And not only did Christ end the Passover, but he instituted the new memorial, the Lord's Supper, that we observe today. Jesus, the true sacrificial lamb, died on the cross to save us from our sins. And he commands his believers to practice what we will be doing in just a few moments. It goes by several different names, the Lord's Supper being one of them. It is not really a supper. This was set in place after the supper meal with Christ and his disciples in very much the same manner that we are practicing it now. But the only difference is instead of a cracker type of unleavened bread, uh, it was more a loaf that they tore pieces off of. And instead of individual serving cups, they drank out of a chalice. But we're practicing what Jesus set in place here. It's not really the Lord's Supper, though it is technically referred to as that. It's called communion. That literally means and really means interaction. When we commune with somebody, we are in interacting with them. And we interact with the Lord in the realization that he has paid for our sins. And we are, when we go through the, the process and we eat the bread and we drink the cup, we are acknowledging and being thankful for and, and appreciating in all of its aspects what that represents. It's also called the Eucharist in other uh, denominations. And that is a word that means the giving of thanks. It reminds us of two imperatives related to our salvation. The vertical relationship with God that's caused because Christ has done this for us. And the horizontal relationship that we have with one another because we are the body of Christ. And just as we're going to be reminded in these next moments, everything involved in our salvation is actually a union. It is a sharing. Early in my ministry, I had someone who was struggling with the fact that you cannot earn your salvation. Uh, they attended a, a church that, that practiced a, a lot of ritual and, and that kind of thing, and uh, they were really struggling with it. And they were finding fault with so much. And one of the things that the person said to me was, you know, your songs are selfish. All of the hymns that you sing talk about you and the blessings you get and so forth. And, and you, you should be concerned about other people. And, and I mean, she just was groping for, for things to, to defend her, her understanding of, of what salvation is all about. Works was very important to her. By the way, she came to know the Lord uh, after that fact, and, and she and her husband were uh, part of our church. But um, she's missing the whole point, or she was missing at that point. Salvation is a universal thing in that you are saved the same way I am saved by the same God, the same act of God, the same love of God, and we are interconnected with one another. 
Paul refers to it a number of ways in his writings. In Ephesians, he calls us a building fitly joined together. Just like this building is made up of plastic and glass and wood and cement, and every part has its, its function, and each of those functions by themselves might be nice. The wood grain of, of the wood might be nice, but when it's in place, it adds so much, and the glass is, is great, but when it's in place and it's colored, it, it adds so much. Each piece makes the whole much more than the individual pieces that make it up. It's all the same building, and we are all the same family saved by the blood of the Lord. And so it is a, a union, a community kind of thing. But I want to take a few minutes and look at what I just said about the vertical and the horizontal. And I'll look at two points, beginning in verse 17 here of Luke chapter 22. He takes the cup, Christ takes the cup, and he says, take this and divide it among you. Petition it among you. Portion it out among you. It's an apportionment. It's like a rationing in a sense. Not that it's restricted, but that every person gets the same allotment. We've seen the movies or read the accounts. Many of them are true of people stranded on rafts in the ocean after their ship has sunk. Or maybe like in the, the Mutiny on the Bounty, there was a, a, a mutiny and they took the officers and stuck them in a dinghy and pushed them away from the ship and then just left them out there in the middle of the ocean. Um, they have often an apportionment of meat and, and drink on the raft. But as the story unfolds, we know what's happening. The, there's no land anywhere around. There's no rescuers anywhere around. They're not able to fish and, and catch anything because they don't have anything aboard the raft to catch their fish with. Their food begins to run out and their water comes down. You know, they have this much water left for three men on a raft and they don't know how many more days to go. So you get a sip, you get an apportionment. Each one gets the same allotment. That's what he's talking about here. Divide this evenly among yourselves. Appropriate it to every one of you that's present. The Lord's Supper is a picture of our salvation. The bread is representative of Christ's body, willingly broken for us. Christ is the living bread. And the cup represents the blood of Christ which washes away our sin. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. You and I were not at the cross. We did not dip our finger in the blood that came forth as they pierced his side or as it trickled down his face from the crown of thorns pressed into it or as the nail prints bled or the whip that tore his back caused the blood to flow. We do not need the literal blood. It is the act that saves us. But we have the same apportionment that that Roman centurion had standing at the foot of the cross and looking up at Christ's body moments after he has died and he declares truly this man was the son of God. The same blood, the same death, it's apportioned to us 2,000 years later. What God brings to the table 
is, is everything that provides for our salvation. What's the one factor that man brings to the table? It's not our works. The Bible says it's not according to works, but according to the blood of Christ. The one factor that we bring to the table is our belief, our willingness to receive. It has to be that way. God doesn't force his way onto us. No one gets to heaven by chance or by accident. No one is born into the family of God because he was born to the right parents who did a lot of good things and raised you right. You followed the golden rule and the Ten Commandments and all of that. No, none of that. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Our efforts are like dirty rags in God's sight, he says. No one is born into the family of God meritoriously or through inheritance or because your family knows the Lord. We understand the Bible dispensationally. That's why I have been taking so much time to teach about the dispensations, the time periods. This is what the Bible teaches. There is another theology that is practiced by many churches. It's called covenant theology. And I do not find support for this particular theology in the, the Bible. What they look at is passages like Acts 16.31, where Paul and Silas have been imprisoned at Philippi, and the, in the middle of the night, the earthquake breaks the prison bars and doors open, the chains fall off the prisoners, the jailer jumps out of bed and rushes to the ruined site and he is ready to take his sword and fall on it because the Romans' law was that that jailer was responsible for every prisoner in his charge. If one prisoner escaped, the jailer's life was forfeit. He thought the prisoners had escaped and Paul and Silas yelled out, we're still here, don't, don't harm yourself. And so joyous was he that he took them into his own house and cleaned their wounds and they witnessed to him and he came to know the Lord. And the Bible says that that very night he and his household were baptized and a covenant theologian will take that verse and a couple of other verses similar to it and say, see that? Every member of this man's house came to know the Lord. So if you have accepted the Lord, be assured, before your family members die, they will accept the Lord. Really? I'm pretty sure you would be able to look at your family tree and conclude that that's not the case. True, we do not know the heart of every individual, but the Bible is clear, by their fruits they shall be known. And there are a couple of family members that um, I really ha have my doubts ever trusted Christ as Savior. I chuckle because of that joke and I never say it well, but my ancestors might have 
hung by their necks but never by their tails. You know? <laughs> in other words, I don't believe in evolution, but not all my family were upright citizens, and <laughs> some of them got hung. Some of my family members were, well, I'll, I'll just, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> remember one individual who was death on anything to do with God, church, and especially ministers, and in particular, television pastors and evangelists. As far as he was concerned, they were all crooks. And uh, they were out for one thing, your money. And nothing that... It, I said to him, or my parents, or others who knew the Lord, ever seemed to sink in with him. I had another, a grandfather that I was very fond of, who was scared to death of accepting the Lord. Because he said, I, I know myself, I could not live up to it, and I, if I lose my salvation, the Bible says that I would be worse off than if I never accepted the Lord. He was raised in that kind of a, an environment. But thankfully, on his deathbed, he trusted in Christ. And I'm told that the calmness that came over him just moments before his death, it was... It was uh, a drastic change. He probably did know the Lord. But not every family member that I had, I'm not expecting to see some of them in heaven. Because salvation is an individual thing. It's not a guarantee to anyone. But God has provided and divided Salvation equally among all who will receive it. Whosoever will may come. The second word that he uses here in Luke 22, 17 comes before the word divide. He says, take this cup and divide it. Get a hold of it. You could look at that cup and say, yeah, there's, there's wine in there. I'm going, oh, I can almost taste it. it it's, it's really good. But if I don't reach out and take that and drink my apportionment of it, it's not real. It's only up here. And that's the way it is with salvation. Initially, this is the offer of salvation. Take hold of what God is giving you. Titus 3, that says, it is not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. He starts off in that passage with the thought that God's kindness has appeared. And it is true. We would be in our sins still if Jesus had not broken into his creation and been born and raised and gone to the cross to pay for our sins. We need to take hold of that and make it ours by not only believing it but receiving it God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come. We are to take what only God can offer. Get a hold of it. Think of it this way. You have ingested a deadly poison and you find out about it and the doctor has examined you and said, yep, it's a poison, all right. And just by... Good luck by chance. I have the antidote right here. Are you going to look at it and say, oh, that's good, doc. Good, I can go home and re relax now. I, oh, yeah. No, you're going to take it. You're going to 
drink it. You're going to do what you have to do to make it yours. And that's the salvation that God is offering. Now is the accepted time, we are told. So, take and divide. There's one final thought that I want to look at, and that's over in Matthew 26, the account that Matthew gives us of the, the Lord's Supper. All four Gospels, by the way, talk about the Lord's Supper. Each one of them has a little different teaching to give us and an approach to it. But in Matthew chapter 26, verse 27, he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, drink from it all of you. This could go back to that thought of divide evenly among each one that's there, but the emphasis here is now on the group itself. Paul was commanded to teach, when you come together, eat of this bread and drink of this cup. Communion was observed on the moon. We've heard the story of the astronaut, the first one to land on on the moon. He had gained permission to take a small communion set with him and set down on the moon he had communion. And that's 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 a fantastic thing, I, I think. The uh, the message that went out to all the world. That happened in the sixties, which we thought was a tumultuous time, but could that be practiced today? No. Anyway, what he practiced on the moon is not really what God once practiced when we partake of communion. It is to be done in the Christian family setting. All four Gospels stress that they all came together. Matthew and Mark put the emphasis on the 12 all in one place. Luke focuses on the Lord Jesus was there with them in the midst. And John says at one point that Jesus spoke about all of you partaking. This is no coincidence. Paul refers to coming together four times when he talks about communion. It's important for the bond, for the family spirit, for the support system. There's a passage in Hebrews that you've heard me speak about often, and I won't have us turn there, but Hebrews 10, verses um, actually 22, 23, 24, and 25. The writer of Hebrews there says, draw near to God, hold fast to the profession of God, the profession we are to be vocal about our salvation to others. And we are to become more and more unified, forsaking not the assembling of ourselves together. John MacArthur is a pastor on the West Coast. I have followed his ministry, all of my ministry. Um, He calls this fellowship love. Togetherness is vital for the Christian. It is as important as any other 
aspect of our relationship with God. You say, wait, 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 a person's relationship with Christ is personal. You've just said that yourself, and yes, I'm not taking away from that. On the core level, it is a personal relationship. But God never intended for it to be a secret relationship. Some of my family members, another set of grandparents, um, they also came to know the Lord, but my granddad was raised Quaker. And he and, and my grandmother were very, uh, I don't want to say secretive, they were, they were very private about their relationship with God. But God has made it clear that he wants us to be trumpets sounding the good news. He wants us to be bright lights reflecting Christ to people and salt that creates a spiritual thirst that other people might come to know him as well. It is a personal matter at the core but if it's a genuine relationship, it is going to show itself publicly. One of the gripes that I have with uh, Facebook, and I don't have a lot of them, but uh, one is the Christians who put the, the little sign up. It usually has a, a nice picture in the background, but it has the words on it similar to Jesus is a, how does this go now? It's a relationship, not a religion. And I understand what they're, they're trying to say, at least I hope I understand. Um, religion is man's attempt to reach God. And many people have their religion, but they don't know the Lord. They're relying and works and all of that. It's a relationship with a Savior that is a, our salvation. I understand that. But what bothers me is there is already such a philosophy out there, even among the church people today, that that's the important thing. As long as my relationship with God is, is, is there, um, I, I, it doesn't matter. I don't have to be serving him. I don't have to be worshiping in the uh, public environment. And I, I can do anything I, I want. I mean, that, my, my salvation is secure. I have a relationship with Jesus. But that's like being married, living in one state, but your spouse is living the other way, the other side of the country. You never interact with that person. You never do anything together with them. The public doesn't know what's, what's going on there with you. you. You certainly do not have a relationship that marriage is supposed to be when you're not involved and it's not out there for everyone to observe. And that's the way it is with us and God. Here, our relationship Godward is indicated in draw near to God, but our relationship inwardly is hold fast to that which we have, and our relationship manwardly is consider one another assemble together, provoke each other or encourage each other unto love and good works. And that's what Hebrews 10 is all about. He says that the greatest thing about coming together isn't necessarily that you are learning the word of God. It's not even that you are serving the Lord. You are encouraging one another unto love and good works. When we have the philosophy of, you know, I can miss church, I, I'll catch up, I'll, I'll be there next week, 
I have talked with individuals who it's six months since they've been in church and when they are reminded of that, they'll look at you like, has it been that long? They don't miss it. All right. What is that saying to the family? What is that saying to the neighbors? What is that saying to others that know you as a Christian? That it's not important. God says it is important. And here's one of the reasons. When we come together around the table, it's the whole aspect that we are part of a whole, of a family whose head is God. And we are here to serve him and one another. And we are teaching our children and, and others who still need to know the Lord. So communion is a vertical check, relationship with God, and a horizontal check, our relationship with one another. And that's why one of the final acts Jesus did before he went to the cross was establish this form of worship. Father, we thank you for your love in our lives and your work in our lives and for the fact that we represent you just because you live in us. May we be excited about that, Father, and looking for ways to be a crystal clear glass through which you shine and reveal yourself. In Christ's name I pray.